back. We're live. We're here on Think Tech Talks. We're talking about community matters. We're talking about mortgages today. Um, mortgages matter to the economy. With John Kutzmeda, who is the CEO of Hawaii Mortgage Center, which is, a, I guess, a mortgage, a mortgage second, sec, a second mortgage company, a mortgage company. No, we are a, um, a primary lender. Primary so lender. We're a mortgage banking firm, so we will. Uh, Lend across all different types of property types, but we are a direct lender. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you, introduce you to John. I think you already did a good job at that. Okay, thank you. So who are you, John? Uh, well, originally from East Coast, I've been in Hawaii now about um, 10 years, and uh, been running this company for about six, and very, very passionate about real estate, very, very passionate about educating people about the financial markets, and making sure they, they make good financial decisions, not just in real estate, but certainly when it comes to making a mortgage decision. Okay, so what, what's your training and what's your education? Uh, two degrees in mathematics, and then I've been basically working in finance and banking since 2006, and running this company for four years. So I have tremendous amounts of experience, um, funded in 2012, upwards of 100 million myself personally, and I've worked with hundreds upon hundreds of clients. So, um, do a little bit of real estate investing on my own, and uh, we also provide capital management services. So we help people make uh, capital investments and provide lending to to borrowers, you know, privately on their own. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, what it means to have a, a mortgage company. I mean, can I open my, my mortgage company uh, by just hanging a shingle on the door? Well, that's a, that's a really loaded question. Um, I think some people try to, but um, in 2000, I'd say up until about 2010 or 11, it didn't take a whole lot to open a mortgage company. I think that's why you saw a lot of the, the chaos that ensued um, during the, the uh, recession in 2009. Um, you had a lot of people who didn't have any financial background, didn't have any business being in the industry of, of both real estate and mortgages that could just walk into the industry and start a company. Nowadays, you have to have a tremendous amount of track record. Um, you have to have the financial wherewithal. You have to be very well capitalized, both personally and as an organization. And there's a huge amount of regulation that goes into it and a lot of training and licensing. So the, regu the regulatory aspect is changing dramatically and a lot of that is just now being enforced. So the consumer as a whole should feel much safer about the marketplace in terms of the um, overall, I'd say, strength of the companies that are out there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting the best consultation just because a, a company has been able to get licensed. Mm. So there's a lot of people out there, I think there's a lot of companies out there that provide a great service in terms of facilitating the loan, but don't necessarily go as far as we do in terms of providing the consultation. So you're actually lending the money. Your, your company, um, Hawaii Mortgage Center, is actually... Mortgage Central, sorry. Mortgage Central is, uh, has the money and lends the money to your mortgagors. Correct, yeah. So we're, and you take mortgage positions on their real property. We do, yep. Okay. Uh, um, do you have a location? Where is it? Well, that's another uh, a great point to bring up. We are located here in Honolulu, but um, it's still a little top secret, but we're about to open uh, a very special office on the leeward side of the island. Okay. So, Where are you in Honolulu? Um, we're actually right at Restaurant Row. Ah, okay. Yep. So uh, just to get a handle on the kind of things you might do. So I am going to buy a house, mm -hmm. and I come to you. And I say, I'm going to buy the house. I need financing. I need 90% financing. <laughs> and uh, what happens then? Um, well, you know, we try to slow the process down a little bit. I think um, people's emotions get ahead of their finances. So we, we try to get to the objective of that decision. Um, sometimes making, you know, an acquisition or buying a house or, or really the way we look at it, taking on this huge amount of debt isn't necessarily the, the first step to the solution they're looking for. So once we have a better idea of what their objective is, we'll start talking about loan options. I mean, we're, we're a relatively small company, so because of that we run very efficiently, and therefore we're able to offer the most competitive rates in the market. So we're never worried about you know, offering the best product. It's really making sure, regardless of what product we offer, it really fits the needs well, of the client. Well, you don't want a junk loan in your portfolio, for one thing. Well, there's there's that truth, but to be honest with you, it's really more about the longevity of the relationship. I mean, it's um, if we have a client who goes into something they're not ready for, 
uh, emotionally it starts to drag on them. Regardless of whether that turns into some sort of financial default for us, it's really more a matter of they're not happy with the experience. They're they're less likely to continue working with us in the future in other aspects of our business. We're so not, you want you want repeat business? Yeah, well, we want the relationship more than anything, and we're not just there um, to operate as a sales engine. You know, we're there to to kind of maintain an ongoing relationship with our customers because you know today maybe they're buying a first time home in a, a small condo or small single family residence. Maybe eventually, which our goal is with all of our clients, they're in a position to start making um, investment decisions and buying additional properties for cash flow and maybe get involved in some of the-, the Building an empire. Building an that's empire. That's okay with you. Well, that's what we want. Um, we're, we're there to facilitate that. We do offer different types of investment options and, and private funds and things that we do on, on the side ourselves to build wealth. So, so why should I go to you instead of First Hawaiian Bank or Bank of Hawaii or CPB or <laughs> Hawaii National Bank and the like? That that's the, I'm so happy you asked that question. Because if there's anything I think the marketplace needs to know is the difference between a large de depository bank like that and a smaller, um, you know, more efficient entity like ourselves. Really your depository lender is the big on every corner type of bank. Um, obviously being on every corner is not cheap. So there's a lot more overhead involved for how they operate their business. And the, the way that they still remain profitable is by passing on higher fees to the customer, higher interest rates. Um, I mean, we can outprice those lenders all day long. It's not even part of the conversation. There is, however, a comfort level that most consumers have with their, their corner street bank. And we can't necessarily argue with that comfort level, but at the end of the day, what consumers don't realize is that loan is ending up in the exact same location. So when we fund a loan, typically um, we are packaging and selling off the servicing rights to that loan to one of the larger entities like say Wells Fargo. Um, and a very familiar name like that is servicing the loan. Um, oh, so you wouldn't service the loan down the line. When you pass it off to say Wells Fargo, they're the ones who are gonna write me and send me bills and whatnot. And take care of your business as most customers are used to on that type of level. So you're in the front end placing the financing and, in the first place. And we do that portion of it very, very well. So at the end of the day, the loan and the cost of which, which really matters in terms of the transaction, um, no one's gonna really compete with us on. And we're very, very careful about who we do business with so that the back end servicing is also top level. Um, the big point to take away from all that is, is the larger institutions that most people have maybe have more familiarity with are doing the exact same thing. So your local banks, although will give that presentation like, hey, we're here, we're local, we're servicing you. Really the way the mortgage business has changed over the past decade, the securitization model, you've got Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, these big entities that buy all these pools of loans all the banks sell to these entities. I mean, that's why they, Fannie and Freddie own basically 75% of the mortgage market. So it's very important for people to realize that your servicing relationship can change and may already be targeted to change the second that loan closes. That's a question they should ask, like, hey, who's gonna service my loan? But really when it comes to getting a good loan, the borrower should look at price, rate, and ongoing that, So have service. to look at the person who is at the front end, like your company. Correct. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's a shift of, of mindset. Most people don't realize that when it comes to more. I want to talk to you about that. I want to yeah. get a handle on the on the sea change, uh, which you're making me aware of just today. Uh, so w what about the money, though? I mean, how much cheaper are your rates than one of the one of the big depository banks? Well, we um, we have a diversification of marketing practices, and, and we've tried even just recently doing some things in newspapers and whatnot. And you'll see that in, in those types of um, advertising, a lot of times there'll be comparative rates. Uh, on average, we're um, I don't want to get too complicated about it, but on average, we're we're definitely at least an eighth better than any lender. Um, and then what was that? Look, point 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 one two five. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. And then when you look at the cost of the loan, which people refer to as points, um, those fees typically range for us close to zero or zero. So we're, we're very heavy about charging nothing on our, on our loans. When you comparatively look at other lenders, they're charging upwards of two points. So if you're, if you're going out there and you're getting an interest rate of about an eighth to a quarter percent lower, you're winning right away. But when you talk about the transaction, the front end, which you and I are, are just now discovering, and someone else is going to charge you, forget interest rate for a second, an additional 2% in closing costs on a $500,000 loan, you're talking another 10 grand in expenses. So it's yeah, significant. So, okay, so it's points, 
Mm -hmm. uh, where the big banks will charge you a point or two Correct. on points. And then there's closing costs. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's all those nickel-dime things. Correct. Are you saying you don't have nickel-dime things? No, I'm saying no matter what, those costs exist. The way we structure our business and the way we try to package a loan and offer to a client, we found a way internally to offset those costs for the borrower so they don't exist to them. So yeah, if you look at a loan, it can get very, very expensive. If you're paying 2% just to get the rate that they're offering, that doesn't include on average the other one to one and a half percent of closing costs, title insurance, you know, appraisal fees, all those types of things. So you could be talking three to four points on a loan that isn't even offering you as good a rate as we are for free. It's, the, um, so you, getting, it's getting through to the consumer as to what we offer and the consumer getting a comfort level with that. That is a challenge for a smaller company like ours. You know, I'm reminded of, um, of an ad that, I don't know if it's playing, playing right now these days, but it used to play, about how these guys were the mom and pop, you know, mom and pop consumer were making a loan or maybe buying insurance or something. Mm -hmm. And and the, and these hypothetical bankers, you know, really internet bankers, were lining up at their door, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. all carrying, all in a dark suit, all carrying a little case of documents, you know, and um, <clears throat> and it was it was probably a good metaphor for all these big banks trying to sell loans. Instead, they went online, and they found it's cheaper. And it, you know, to me, that denoted the a new time, yeah, a new time when you can go online, because at the end of the day. It really doesn't, well, we, we should make exception on it. You know, it doesn't much matter who you bought the loan from. I would as, agree. As long yeah. as you get a good rate, you know, and as you said, the service, the servicing bank is not going to play games with you. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like there's a sea change happening here. There should be. And it's about yeah. the Internet. Am I right about that? I think it's about um, education. I think the Internet has allowed so much more information to basically transfer amongst people that could never get access to it. So now people are very, uh, are, are able to educate themselves on things like you and I are discussing and how the mortgage industry really works and all these different types of moving parts. So first of all, they have a comfort level with it. So at the end of the day, if they hear about something that we offer, they don't get that, well, it sounds too good to be true. I don't know this guy. I'm just going to go to the local bank and get ripped off. And not that the, the lo you know, these companies are doing anything, um, that is basically intended to be harmful, they're running a business. It's the consumer's job to basically research their options. And I think they're, um, we're not talking about you know, going on Amazon and buying a book and getting as cheap as possible. You're talking about a financial decision, and most people um, get very nervous about that, and they, they kind of do the ostrich. Well, right? I think part of it is the documents. You know, <laughs> yeah. because you go into you go for a closing on a, on a mortgage loan, and somebody's handing you you know 27 documents, and there's no time to really read them, and you get nobody reading them over your shoulder. It's you and, and the adverse party, the banker. <laughs> You're preaching to the choir. Let me tell you. <laughs> and, yeah. And I, you know, I think that doesn't actually create a lot of credibility right. with the bank because you don't you don't feel the bank is really telling you what's going on, um, and it also I mean, if you get if you run into trouble. It's not like all that sweet and smile is going to be there anymore. Uh, the bank will take you apart, just like the documents say. And if the documents are unfair, you know, you get nailed. And in this state, I'm sure you know, you know, there are multiple ways to foreclose a mortgage. Some of them are really bloody draconian. Still now today, even now today. Yeah, I, that's, um, I, you know, it's, it may be difficult in this type of interview to really portray how much I agree with you and how hard we work to kind of break down that barrier because for us, we're one of the last companies, believe it or not, even though we make a living doing it, that will do a loan just to do a loan. Um, we talk people out of transactions all the time. You know, it's kind of... You can't afford this. You shouldn't do it. It's not the right time. Do you really have a sense of what you're getting <laughs> into? Um, have you been following the trends in the marketplace? You know, financially, yeah, I could get you the loan, but look at all the other debt that you have and haven't been able to manage. Is this really going to make your life better? And like I said earlier, it's really getting to the core objective of that intention. Um, it's not about talking people out of it. It's about slowing it down. Because oftentimes, people are making these decisions strictly on emotion. And hopefully, we'll have time to kind of talk about where the market is going. But you know, the rental market here is, is very interesting. And I think people kind of look at their situation when they rent and say, well, 
I'm paying this much for rent, I'm kind of fed up, I'll just go buy. And that's kind of the, the perfect storm that you know the banking world wants to more or less create. And it's not as necessarily simple as that. Like if you're renting and you're unhappy, you pick up and move. If, like you're saying, if you get into a financial situation after you've already signed on the dotted line for 30 long years, and there's a blip in the marketplace, your property's not worth the same, or you've lost your job, <clears throat> you don't just wipe your hands of it. I mean, it could create a financial disaster for you for decades to come. And that's something not to be taken lightly. And we certainly don't because again, we feel like there's lots of ways to build wealth in our industry that don't just include taking on a ton of debt and buying your first home. Are you like other, others like you? I mean, do you represent a trend uh, or are you unique? This, this is uh, not an easy question either, but... Uh... Well, I, I think my ego would like to say, like you? <laughs> I, I, my ego would like to say no. Um, <laughs> I, I would hope so. I, I think for the sake of this this country, which is really you know burdened by debt, that there's other people out me who out there like me who understand this. And even though we're in the industry of, of providing capital, um, take take it with a, a deep sense of conscience and and. Um, I, I haven't really come across anyone out here. I think that's one of the reasons our clients are so faithful and basically treat us with fanfare. It's because we are very contrary. In well, up till now, how many loans have you closed? I couldn't really track, but I, I can tell you in the last two years, it's, it's probably been over 300. Mm, okay. So that's me personally. The company does a little more than that. How many people are employed? Um, I'd say we have about eight. Okay. Yeah. John Kurtzmeda, he's the CEO of Hawaii Mortgage Central, which is an interesting name for a mortgage company. And we're going to know more about that mortgage company. We're going to know more about um, mortgages as they affect the economy in this state and, and I guess the lives of the individual mortgagors. Uh, here on Think Tech Talks Community Matters, I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be right back after this very short break. to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, this state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're at ThinkTech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about Community Matters today with John Kutsmeda. He's the CEO of Hawaii Mortgage Central, which is doing business in Hawaii and maybe other states too. Correct. We're also in California, Colorado, Nevada, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And your secret sauce is that you care. You know what? That's, I'm going to, can I take that? Sure. Okay. That is actually, our, <laughs> I would say, our, our secret sauce. That really is what defines us. I mean, you can talk about the quality of the product, hey, we've got better rates and all that type of stuff, but I think the consumer nowadays especially deserves that type of attention and needs to know that you know, a company like this is, is definitely out there. Okay, tracking on the, this whole thing that I see as a sea change, sir, you can be a mortgage company without having a million billion dollars in assets. You can, be, you can start a mortgage company on a lot less money now. You can, um, we have to define mortgage company. You can basically be in the business of soliciting or selling mortgages um, with far less capital than that. I mean, those types of... It's a storefront thing, right? Well, it's You a, don't have yeah. to have your own money to invest. Um, technically, not many of these mortgage banking firms do. It's uh, warehouse credit facilities. Um, it's it's short-term funding. So you make a deal with a bank that they help you with the cash necessary to sort of start it up and then you you sell that mortgage back to a say Wells Fargo whatever it is mm -hmm. and um, and you're out and then the individual uh, borrower is in essentially in contract with Wells Fargo you've taken your piece out of it you've consulted and advised and 
maybe saved him from some bad situations, but you're not in there for the long term on that mortgage. Lending has changed in the sense that really nobody is. Um, the way we're structured, yes, we have credit facilities that allow us to fund these loans and then sell them off and continue to rinse and repeat. Um, there's also brokers in the market which can bring loans to entities like ours to fund on their behalf. So they're kind of more of that intermediary negotiator trying to find the best deal for their client and they bring it to entities Would like Would you sell ours. me a mortgage? Would I sell you personally? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a few bucks in the bank, right? I want to buy a mortgage. Um, if it's distressed property, that's okay, because I'm, I'm carnivorous. And I don't mind taking it back and putting somebody on the street. Okay. So, uh, you know, the mortgage balance is, um, I don't know, say $100,000. I'll give you eighty for it. That's probably a good deal for you. Now, it's probably worth less than that. But <laughs> um, that's a whole other conversation. You're not involved in that. No, I am. I love, the, I love the business of trading notes. Um, because the, the types of conversations we're having right now, the types of business that we do, that's not, that's like when we do a loan, it's not on our books, we're not servicing it, so it wouldn't be something if it went distressed, I would look to liquidate it at a discount like you're mentioning. That is something we do do with private investors, people who maybe out of their own money lent to somebody to fix up a property and sell it or first time home buyer in a, in a lower income. They come to you and they say, I'd like to sell my loan. Hey, I can't get this off my books. Or usually what we do is we deal in, in um, the bulk asset purchase. Sure. So, well, and, uh, hey, I've got 10 of these that aren't performing. And that's really what the banks do. They trade these things. Sure. Well, but no reason why you can't do that, too. There's no reason why you can't do that. Absolutely. Anybody so, can do that. And that's so, part of when we talk to people. It's like, hey, I see that you're really just trying to get involved in investing. And you think the best way is just to go out there and buy a house. Let's talk about other opportunities to create a return on the money you have sitting in the bank that you're seeing no no return on your deposits. There's smarter ways to do it. Play like the bank, play like an investor. And that's where I think that education gap is starting to shrink because I can give them suggestions or ideas and not have to run a seminar on it. They can go Google it and learn about this stuff. Yeah. Um, but one important point to make um, before we run off on that tangent is um, not just companies like us, like mortgage banking firms, but even big depository lenders, okay, when they fund these loans, they are also packaging them up and selling them off so they can be pulled together in these mortgage securities. So don't get confused that just because they're a big bank and they have way more you know, access to reserves and capital than we do, that the mortgage isn't going through the same rinse and... It could go to the same place. It could go, and, and I'll be fair and honest with you, the majority of the lenders here are selling to the same people we are. Yeah, okay. Now, suppose, but let me change the facts on you. Suppose you're placing a new mortgage. Okay. Okay, and it's a $100,000 mortgage, and you call me up and say, Jay, maybe you'll be interested in this one. And I get to be the mortgagee. Is that possible? Um, Yes, anything. I'm is, not a bank. I'm just me. Yeah, anything is possible. Um, that it's not the structure of our business because we need to know ahead of time, you know, who our investors are, their criteria for buying these loans, and most importantly, like I mentioned to you before, just because we're out of the deal doesn't mean we're out of the relationship. So the bar I represented, I don't know you as a servicer. That's going to be a concern. What's for a me. servicer anyway? I send him bills. And when he's late, I get nasty. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Tell me you haven't been on the phone with one of your credit card companies or one of your mortgage companies and been aggravated because the service is miserable. Oh, sure. Right. So service that, meaning uh, they make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. But They don't give you credit for the payment. But who but, does that reflect back on? I'm telling you right now, it comes on me. Yeah, how you put me together with these Correct. guys. They're so nasty whatnot. Yeah. So okay, that's, what's, what's, the, what's the worst case analysis on getting with a, a bad servicer? Um, and I won't, I won't give names, but there have been some, yeah. there are some mortgage companies doing business in this town that were predatory at the least, and really did, in my personal observation, some horrible things. Um, what's the worst case? What can happen? It's just a foreclosure, right? Um, I, I like to think most borrowers have more personal pride than that, and um, it's not about, oh, my credit's gonna have a ding, it's that nobody wants to you know, go back on a promise. They know the promise that they made. Um, oftentimes, you know, when those situations occur, it's because of other circumstances that, you know, they lost their job, they got injured. Um, most of the times people are, are making very bold efforts to try to work it out 
with the um, servicer so that they can retain their home. And ah, so when you say servicer, a good servicer is somebody that you can actually talk to. Well, it's in their best interest. Maybe work yeah, it out. Yeah, it's know. in their best interest, I think, in the big picture for them to be willing to do so. But again, there's a different business models. Like you said, some people just want to clean the street. And if you, you don't meet the terms of the agreement, you know, we're foreclosing, no. we're getting rid of you. And what I'm talking about, I guess, in, in the one the one case that's in my mind is is where the, um, the servicer is actually deceiving uh, the mortgagor and uh, tell, it's going to be okay. We'll we'll send you a proposal. Uh, we're going to give you some kind of break, and that's nice on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, uh, there's a non-judicial mortgage decree, foreclosure decree, mm -hmm. and the guy's on the street and somebody's living in his house, all without real process, all without getting served with papers or anything. And I think that's still possible in Hawaii. You want to comment on mortgage foreclosures and how they operate here? Well, I, I think it, it goes in line with um, before you make the decision, you want to know you have the right counsel. Um, you know, if you're talking to somebody like us, it's the long of that relationship that matters. So if somebody starts to get in that circumstance, we expect that they call us, not because we're involved in servicing the loan, but so that we can at least give them, you know, a, a, a sense of clarity as to what their options Would are. Would you intercede for me? No, and that, what I was kind of leading to is that we can then, you know, advise them that, hey, you need to seek legal counsel. And I think the, the problem is, even at the time of the transaction, people aren't necessarily, you know, really getting the information that they need. And especially at that point in the game, just because you spoke to somebody on the phone, you're now in a legal situation that you need to take with much greater precaution than somebody on the other side of a telephone that you can't hold accountable for what they told you. So people really need to take, realize that there's a ton of responsibility once you sign up for that. So I need counsel for this kind of transaction? What kind of, the, the for a mortgage transaction. I mean, if, I, you know, if I'm giving a mortgage on my house, my, my residence, my, my most valuable asset, you know, either now or, or later, um, so we need counsel. I don't think it's a bad idea to challenge everything. So just because, and again, I'm telling you this as somebody who's in this business, I certainly would want my transactions to be as smooth as possible, but I don't want people to be ignorant. I want people to realize what they're getting into, and if they have questions, ask them at the right time, not in the final closing table when it's all you know right then and there and they, they start getting cold feet. But yes, they, they need to challenge everything and they need to be educated. Does that mean legal counsel? Not necessarily. I don't think the mortgage process is that intense, but once you start getting to the process of where there's legal action being taken, I don't care what it is, but in the case of a home, mm -hmm. you should probably talk to an expert. Yeah. Okay, well, just shifting now to the macro picture. Okay. Um, you know, we said we would talk about the economy and um, certainly, and the market, okay? And I, I don't know whether you intended to talk about the market as a mor mortgage market or as a real estate market. All of it. Or as both, Let's all the foregoing. All yeah. So, I mean, this is an interesting market here. I mean, we have right now, for example, um, all these condos going on in, in, in Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I say going on, I don't mean built yet. <laughs> I think going, that's a great way of putting it. Going yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of talk, noise, stum, drung, whatnot. <laughs> no, but going on. Yeah. And and you got people, local people, who you know are attracted by all the noise and stum and the drung, and they they want to buy, they want to in, they want to be involved. This is especially the young people. They mm -hmm. want to get involved. And then they find out that these condos are like a million dollars or you know, <laughs> close to it. And uh, I don't know where the affordability is there. Um, you learned right there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's a real interesting market. And then there's nothing. There's no real inventory there right now anyway. Right. And so and then they start looking at secondary places, and they can't find any. And then you wind up coming back to square one, which is like zero activity. Um, so how do you see this market? Uh, you know, it, 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 as against expectations mm. for a new world for the young, for the millennial generation, and how do you see it unfolding? Um, that's a fantastic question. First of all, demand is really driving a lot of this buzz and hype. Uh, I think a lot of people look at the inventory of homes here, especially new inventory, and first thing they'll say is there's, you know, there's a boom of population. People are always going to come to Hawaii. Um, this is it, home prices are only going to go up, and God isn't making more any more island, so get it while you can get it. 
Um, so there's that argument I think is really driving the momentum of the development. Um, certain city planning that is allowing this expansion, I think it, it makes sense on those types of levels. But these price points, um, I would question. And the main reason I would question is, is affordability. And really at the end of the day, what makes real estate affordable, or really what buoys the value of real estate, is affordability. It's not about you know how much land there is in Hawaii. Because if you have a credit issue, people there's very few people. There's the percentage is probably less than one percent that are buying houses in Hawaii, all cash. So everyone is reliant on the cost of debt. And if you have credit markets slow down or freeze up like you um, saw at the time of the recession in the, in the financial crisis, kind of similar to this summer when the Federal Reserve started hinting that they're going to scale back on their QE stimulus and all of a sudden rates you know, flew up and the market froze, didn't know what it wanted to do. If you have a um, restriction of credit or a, a slowing down of credit, then you're not going to be able to buoy those prices, and those prices are going to come down because only those people that are capitalized and liquid enough to put larger down payments are going to be able to come to the market. And that's, I really think, the tug of war you're going to see going forward, especially without these projects even built yet, is that um, is the affordability there. Wage growth is basically, and this is an argument I've made in editorials and whatnot, wage growth has been non-existent. So you know, if interest rates even creep up just a little bit more, you're going to have a big affordability issue because people aren't making enough money to pay for this. They legitimately aren't going to be able to continue to pay those mortgage payments. And really what you end up getting is a market that's driven by speculation. That, well, it's 800,000 today, it always goes up, tomorrow it's gonna to be a million. And eventually people run out of gas servicing that huge, those huge loads of debt and the market has to scale back and correct. Um, so that, you know, I think those type of headwinds are going to be very real going forward, not only in Hawaii, but on a macro level, if the economy doesn't start getting its act together. And I, th I think we're burdened by regulation, and I think we're... What regulation is that? Across the board. I think from the... the I mean business regulation in general? In general, I think business regulation, I think um, the way our, our, you know, look at the gridlock in Capitol Hill. We can't decide on anything. Uh, we need, you know, quick execution from our political leaders. We need to, you know, big reform across the country. You know, we need infrastructure going again. It's not, everything is buoyed yeah. by debt, debt. And Talking debt. about the economy in general. Yeah, yeah. But that's, the, you know, you're, everything goes back to that, the fundamentals, which is, you know, is the average Joe maintaining a good job that they're confident with? Are they out there spending? 70% of our economy is consumption. People can't consume if they're not working. And that's a big conversation itself. The unemployment numbers are really right now being heavily scrutinized because the Fed is saying we're watching the unemployment numbers. And if they improve, we'll scale back on stimulus. And if they don't, we may stick around longer with QE, three, four, five, who knows how many QE. So if you're reaching you know, with maybe a rate that's a little high or worse, a price that's too high, or a space that's too big to begin with, um, and then and you're stretched because you have a job that could be, you know, come and go, <laughs> uh, depending on the economy, or your income is otherwise dependent on an economy which may be a little, a little shaky, uh, then you wind up losing your property in a foreclosure. Yeah. Um, I, I, if that I, happens on a, on a broad scale, mm -hmm. and, and, and forgetting national, just local, mm -hmm. if that happens on a broad scale in Hawaii, what happens? What happens, for example, to Kaka'ako if a lot of local young people buy million dollar condos they really can't, which you would advise them not to buy? I would advise them to make themselves aware of all the cards that are on the table. It's not really necessarily my place to say, don't do it. It's more, hey, do you realize what you're doing? But but you can go get a valuation. You can get a, a Zillow valuation or a value your home value valuation for ten or twenty bucks, and you can see that uh, maybe the other appraisal is too high, or that um, this isn't this isn't going to pencil out somehow. And you would you wouldn't you say to the young person involved, are you sure that you a that you know it's worth that much, mm -hmm. and are you sure that you know you can service a mortgage of this size? Um, and, and so maybe you ought to go back and A, look for something else, or B, maybe you ought to negotiate before you close this deal. Is that a good word? Yeah. 
I, is that within your pay grade? Yeah, I, I think um, we beg that question no matter what. Is this something you can afford? And ironically, regulations are now forcing everybody in our business to document that type of, you know, have you put this borrower through a, you know, resilience test, if, if you will. Um, we well, not to your own self, but for the benefit of the borrower. Right, well, that's the intention. We do it anyways because at the end of the day, what our purpose is is, is the longevity of that relationship. Not We're not thinking transactionally. We're thinking transformationally. You know, We want to engage in that relationship long term. Um, so we do beg that question no matter what. But you know, there's so many other things that come into play than what is happening in the real estate market today. Basically, if you're looking at things today, you're already too late. You know, you, you need to be looking, you know, with some sense of forward guidance. And in order to look forward, you need to know the things that can impact the market and drive the market. Yeah, demand's going to have a factor, but, you know, where's the credit situation going to be in another three to four or five years? Where do you think it's going to be? Um, that's for another show. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's rated R. Now, I, I, I think there's, um, there's a lot more to discuss before getting into kind of where our forecasts are going forward. We, we feel there's a ton of promise in Hawaii. I think there's a ton of promise in Kaka'ako, as well as in the Leeward area. They have a, a ton of development planned out there. That's why we look to be positioned out there. Um, but still, you know, the fundamentals need to be there. Is Hawaii's economy growing in the sectors that it needs to? Um, is the certain types of things that are going on that could buoy a housing market? You know, a, a, a condo in Kaka'ako for $800,000, I mean, is, the, is that a median priced home? I mean, I hear economists say in Hawaii all the time that in another five, 10 years, the median home is going to be a million. It's real easy for them to throw that out there as if, poof, this is what's happening in the real estate market. But you're talking the median, the middle. That means, and typically the average person is affording this. I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see inflation happening right now, nor does the Fed. That's why they keep ongoing with the QE stimulus because the, the targets for inflation are continually missed dramatically. So if you're not seeing a, a, you know increase in inflation and wage growth going with that, how are you going to sustain that? And even if you have inflation, at the end of the day, you're really not gaining any wealth. If, if your house is worth a million, but a gallon of milk is worth $10, did you really get, get anywhere? You're mm -hmm. really just running on the treadmill. So there's a lot more to consider when going into that type of transaction instead of like, oh, I'm never gonna own if I don't jump in now, or I'm gonna be priced out of the market. And a lot of people, at my age range or younger, you know, similar peers, I think that's the emotional weight that they have. Like, ah, oh, you know, I'm gonna be priced out. I'm never gonna be able to afford it. If I don't do it now, then it's gonna be two million by the time I'm 40. And I, I see those types- There's a possibility that's true. Yeah, and that's a decision that they have to make assessing all the parameters, not just looking at, you also have to understand the baby boomers had a big part in driving the market where they've driven it. And now the baby boomers are all leaving the marketplace. So you've had a 30-year bull run in just about every type of marketplace because of this, this boom of population reaching their peak spending in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s, and now they're scaling back. And, and that's having a big impact on, on the macro market. So let, let, one more macro piece, uh, and that is, uh, so you have at least potentially a lot of foreign money, Asia money coming in, like the Japanese came in in the 80s. Um, and that boosts the market because it's a lot of demand. And um, I mean, the Japanese paid anything you asked and more. I don't think the Chinese pay so liberally. Um, but they're going to, you know, there's a fair chance that somebody from Asia, maybe the Koreans, who knows, would come in and buy a lot of these condos. And they're going to use them as retreats or rent them out. They're not necessarily going to live there. They're going to, they're probably taking a cash loss but they'll pay a very high price. And this, of course, makes the, the units next door a high price. And tax assessments go up and all that. <clears throat> so how, how does the young person deal with that? Because at the end of the day, if that money leaves, you know, then the whole thing collapses, doesn't it? Uh, it means that they're overpriced because, because buyers from offshore are paying too much. Like, same thing that we had in the 80s and in the early 90s. It, 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 it found its mark. Mm -hmm. um, what does the young buyer do? I think, um, I think you hit it right in the head there. The market will find its mark. It, it, it's going to find its equilibrium. And it's, you know, it, it can't be buoyed by just one thing. And, the, you know, Japan, that's a whole other conversation, but Japan is in, economically in deep trouble. 
Um, I, I put a lot of emphasis right now on the demographic shifts in countries like Japan um, and certainly here in the U.S. I think it, it can also help even the, the seniors retiring to places like Hawaii. There's, there's a lot of wealth in the baby boomers that I think will find its way here to Hawaii. And I, I see it already because a lot of people who are getting into that first time home buyer step, they're getting into it with help from their parents. And, and the, the mindset is, you know, that, that dogma is, is like, well, this is what you do, right? You buy a house, you, you know, you get your job and it, it's a different the market. American dream. The American dream has changed. <laughs> and I think the American dream is um, moving way too quick nowadays for most people to keep up with it. And that doesn't mean you just, you know, jump into the deep end, holding your nose and closing your eyes. I think you got to have the right support, the right type of team on your side. That's, that's really what we try to do is get people on a level where we're not necessarily telling them what to do, but they have a better sense of all the things that are moving around them. And they're not just basically chasing the hype. It sounds like the big advice point here <clears throat> is to take a close look, educate yourself, follow it for a while. Don't jump in on the basis of, a, of any rush act. <clears throat> and then when you feel you're appropriately educated and um, you know, you've got a handle on where, where in your heart you feel this is going, <laughs> then you move. But if you move too quick, then I think you stand a chance of making a huge mistake. You, maybe it's right. Maybe you're doing. Maybe you're getting on the wave, as many people ha have had yeah, over the years. Absolutely, and that's. But that's speculation. And if you're willing to speculate, it's no different than gambling at Vegas. You want to know your odds. You want to be good at the game. And I think you you need to work on that skill set before you jump on a train that is merely about cashing in and cashing out. What is your strategy? Is it cash flow? Do you think you're going to be out priced out, you know, priced out of the market? You know, we, I kind of look at the analogy of if you were getting into a relationship, just because you met someone for the first time, you wouldn't propose and marry to them, right? And, but that's the same thing. Like people will suddenly get this idea that I'm going to buy. I'm going to buy real estate today. And then they call a real estate well, agent. Sometimes it takes that, you know? Sometimes it takes that kind of weird flamboyant thing. I, I think, think I'll buy a house today. Right, you know? I, I think that's it takes that spark to be headed that direction, but I don't think it, it, it's it's necessarily a time to execute on it. And then people will go to people on the sales side of the business real estate agent and say, hey, what should I do? And they're very present-minded thinking. And um, they're obviously in the business of selling, so they're going to be great at giving you guidance as to what's going on in the market, what properties are available, you know, this, the, how to streamline the transaction, but are they really going to slow you down and say, hey, we've been on a 30-year bull cycle. Um, these are the types of trends and headwinds that we may have. These are the types of things that continue, could continue to support you know, the current levels in real estate. This is going, you're just not going to get that type of information. So you need to date the idea of, of buying a home. I think you Age need, the idea, you mean. Age yeah, the idea, yeah. yeah. I mean, and also you have to find a good price. I mean, going into a condo which, which has all these you know, uh, tabs and columns and charts and graphs, about about all these really high expensive things may not be the best way to find a good price. Sometimes you go secondhand and look, and you find a real a real benefit there. You know, and and I think to that extent, um, another problem as a whole is the, the most people don't have the patience to um, you know kind of wait for their turn or. Um, you know, there's this entitlement, right? Like, I, I should be able to get that house. Or there isn't, you know, the starter home doesn't seem to exist as much as it used to. The fixer upper, you know, getting the cottage out no. in somewhere. The starter home becomes an expensive million dollar home. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that's where the mom and dads are now coming in and helping out. And um, I, I don't know if that's really heading them down the right path where really all they've done is now stuck themselves in a situation that is driven by the cost of the debt and not necessarily what their real objectives were. I think you're in a really interesting spot, John, because uh, I think we do have a millennial generation. These are the uh, young people who either came back or stayed here who formed the next generation of the economy, really. It's not a small thing. And how they do in housing is going to have a secondary effect on whether they stay here for the long term and whether their economy, their economy works out. And if they don't do well in housing and their economy doesn't work out, 
this place is on a slippery slope in general, not just in Kaka'ako. I think you can make that argument just about anywhere, and you're, you're spot on. <laughs> yeah, and if, you know, education then starts to become a question, how are right. you building... all kinds of secondary yeah. effect. Yeah. John Kutzmeda, CEO of uh, Hawaii Mortgage Central. This is Think Tech Talks, Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. We've been talking about um, mortgage, the mortgage market, and the economy. But I think I'm going to rename it here at the end and say, Mortgages are marriages. I like it. You yeah. can use that too. Okay, thank you. Aloha, John. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs>